Uh, the question is, uh, what are the fetal white matter correlates between schizophrenia and Asperger's? This is a question that is about brain structural abnormalities uh, in patients with different types of neuropsychiatric disorders. These are two completely different neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, schizophrenia is an adult disorder uh, that involves experiencing hallucinations and delusions, certain negative symptoms like loss of motivation, social withdrawal. Asperger's, by contrast, is a disorder main, that's first identified in childhood in many cases. Uh, it's related to autism, so it features difficulty in social interaction and uh, specific, uh, very narrow types of interests like being interested in trains or cars or repetitive behaviours. But unlike autism, Asperger's does not feature language delay. So these are two completely different disorders uh, that historically were considered to be the same, but now that's not thought to be the case. And the important point the questioner is making is that they both have been reported to be associated with specific types of brain structural differences. So, for example, the brains of patients with schizophrenia uh, have been reported to be smaller overall. There are certain fluid-filled spaces in the middle of the brain called the ventricles, that have been reported to be larger in patients with schizophrenia. And there are certain white matter tracts, those are the uh, connections between two different brain areas, uh, where maybe the white matter um, is less prevalent or maybe it's not organised in quite the same way. And that's in schizophrenia. Uh, by contrast, in Asperger's, uh, the findings are different. Uh, if anything, the brains of patients with Asperger's have been found to be slightly larger. The questioner makes reference to uh, fetal white matter differences and that's an important point because one of the difficulties in interpreting the results of brain imaging studies conducted in children or in adults is that we don't know whether the uh, brain is causing the disorder as it were or the altered experience of the environment or maybe certain medications that the individual might take could potentially be affecting uh, the brain structure itself. So it would actually be very useful to be able to study individuals before they became ill. And that has been possible in patients with schizophrenia um, using uh, individuals who are in what's called an at-risk mental state. Uh, so this doesn't cover the fetal question, but it does study individuals before they get to the stage of illness. And by and large, uh, the, some of the brain abnormalities have been reported to be the same, but some of the more general gross brain abnormalities like the overall difference in structure, may actually be related to the experience of being ill itself as opposed to being a causal factor. But we can't really study using brain imaging methods uh, things that are going on in the womb. The brain imaging methods that we use for research purposes are not generally carried out on pregnant women. And in any case, it would be very difficult uh, because the brains of fetuses are so small uh, to understand exactly what's going on because the resolution of our technology is not there yet. So although the questioner raises an important point, which is that we need to study individuals before they get ill um, in order to understand the causal nature um, of any, say, brain structure or function differences, uh, our technology is, is not quite there yet to be able to answer this question, I'm afraid. Uh, the question is, why do neuroscientists use simple statistical methods that rely on many assumptions when analysing fMRI data? So the questioner here is referring to functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a technique by which we can analyse a correlate of brain activity, uh, which is basically blood flow, while individuals are carrying out, um, say, certain psychological tasks, maybe doing a difficult memory task versus an easy memory task. These brain imaging models are actually conducted using very complex uh, statistical models normally. So uh, the most commonly used package is called statistical parametric mapping and it creates a, a form of a regression model uh, within each individual uh, participant and does this using multiple predictors of the uh, brain activity or in fact the, the brain blood flow which is really what we're looking at using this method. Uh, so these incorporate uh, corrections for the fact that this signal can fluctuate over time and also the fact that the signal that we're measuring is quite slow so that the images that we collect tend to correlate with each other if they're collected quite closely in time as opposed to far away in time. So normally we collect an image every two or three seconds or so. So I would say that these statistical models are actually uh, fairly sophisticated. Um, however, the questioner 
does raise an important issue, which is why we use a uh, technique, which is a, called a parametric technique, which makes certain assumptions about uh, specifically the uh, errors or residuals left over after we've tried to account for our data using our statistical model. The reason that these kinds of models have been adopted in, in statistical parametric mapping, this particular software package, is that they're very efficient. So these kinds of statistical models allow one to make inferences about the data and uh, afford great sensitivity in the analyses. And they are common to the kinds, or similar to the kinds of statistical packages that are used in almost all kinds of uh, research, be it epidemiological um, or, or genetic or, and uh, many other types of research beside. So in general, scientists tend to use parametric statistical models where they can because it's a more sensitive way of analysing the data. However, there are some software packages that don't use this par parametric statistical technique and they're called non-parametric methods. Um, and without going into the technical details, they require considerably more computational resources, um, which makes um, some of the uh, computer processing time uh, much longer. Uh, so historically that's why they weren't used. That's less of an issue today. Um, uh, the other issue is the kinds of inferences that one can make. So in using these non-parametric methods, one tends to end up making inferences in terms of how big a cluster of activation might be, uh, as opposed to uh, the peak activation of the response, or uh, to put it another way, instead of how much of the brain is being activated, which is what you can easily get from non-parametric methods. Parametric methods allow you to say how much of an area of the brain is being activated, uh, and they're two quite different uh, concepts and may be useful uh, in different ways. So examples of non-parametric methods in uh, neuroimaging data include something called XBAM, um, which was developed at King's College London, and there's another one called CAMBA, which is developed um, at the University of Cambridge. And there is actually a version of statistical parametric mapping called uh, statistical non-parametric mapping, uh, which was developed by uh, a statistician now at the University of Warwick. So both parametric and non-parametric methods are used in the analysis of brain imaging data.